Gnashish for your patience. Cha ade khat nayu, lingek enach yeh kyu khat do sak, dlekhak enach vivian mor kyu khat do sak, yeh khat uti, taktein thana yeh khat, taqari yeri ka kagwan than da chhansu, kachhana kudite ka khuna kaudak yaida. Junok Yeti Ka Gwashye Heinz fifty seven Dachto Chinese, Hawaiian, Sami, Irish, Ka Tleshkwasiku, huge family. Um, and as many of you know, that is Tlingit for hello. Uh, in the Tlingit culture, uh, we like to start with Chaade Khatnayo. Just uh, please forgive me if anything today, uh, if I don't do this right. Uh, or if anyone's offended by anything that I have to say. Uh, in the Tlingit language, my name is Yeik, or Cute Little Raven. In English, uh, my name is Vivian Mork, and I'm from the Raven Moyeti, and I'm Taktein Tan. I'm a child of the Tekwedi, and I'm a grandchild of the Kagwan Tan and the Wolf People. And I also come from a very large multicultural family. So I'm also Chinese, Hawaiian, Sami, Irish. I feel like a little bit of a, the walking history of Alaska. And uh, I was born and raised in Wrangell, but my Kawan lineage, you know, coming in from Glacier Bay, uh, a little biased to those areas, I guess. But uh, I do live here uh, in Juneau now. And uh, I know I see a lot of familiar faces in the room, so. Yay, Gunashish for coming. <laughs> and uh, so as many plans go, uh, things don't go as planned. So as you know, uh, the day uh, was uh, kind of the timing was pushed back a little bit. So instead of starting at 1.30, we started at 2 for this. And we're, uh, I'm going to help that one better. I'm going to shorten my talk so that the next talk ends up on time. <laughs> and uh, there's a couple of reasons why uh, we're doing that, but also because as we plan things, the elders that were supposed to sit on the panel today couldn't. One of the elders had to go to Anchorage for medical, one of the elders had to go to sit for Sitka for medical, and one of the elders had to stay home in the village, which um, as we talk about this topic is another variable into the things that we're dealing with as the climate changes, you know, uh, our elders aging. And so here we are doing what we're doing. I also had no idea I was presenting in this kind of setting and room and, uh, and uh, with these cameras. So uh, for those of you that know me, we were going to do this a bit more loose. And I thought this was going to be in a classroom. We are going to be looking around each other. And I was going to bring in big piles of food. And we we're going to talk story. And we were going to share all of our different personal uh, stories about what we've experienced in harvesting during and changing climate and things. And here we are. And now I got this short little uh, PowerPoint presentation ready <laughs> to talk a little bit about that. But I still, we've got Anne, who's going to volunteer to bring the microphone around to people. Uh, so that'll help uh, with the way the setting has changed up a little bit uh, when we get to that point. And uh, as we, as, with the elders that I was talking with about organizing this talk and what we were what we wanted to do was to just simply give us more of a space and place to hear our stories with each other because we don't get this opportunity uh, that often. And so it's really great that the Sharing Our Knowledge Conference has made, had, had made climate change the theme. Uh, I'm a traditional foods and medicine educator, for those of you that don't know me, and I'm also a Clinket language teacher, and uh, I own a small shop downtown here in Juneau called Planet Alaska. And I've been a part of grant after grant, working for the university or uh, various schools or search. And we build these beautiful programs that are gone in three to five years, depending on the grant. And I got tired of chasing grants around. So uh, my master's thesis was business with the purpose of perpetuating culture and how we can do that in surviving in the Western economy while still holding up our culture. And I'm not a big fan of being told what to do, so this works out really well for me. And uh, I'm glad we've done it. We've just jumped in uh, head first uh, and this uh, spring. 
and it's going really well so far. We've got a lot of positive feedback from the community. We've already been able to partner with Huna Indian Association, the Southeast Alaska Discovery Kids Program, teaching kids all about harvesting. And uh, it's, it's been difficult talking about climate change the last few years. Uh, because when I was growing up, it was uh, a fact. It was science class, uh, things like that. And uh, so uh, you can see uh, the uh, PowerPoint. I started right off the bat with, yes, the climate has always been changing. Uh, that seems to be one of the uh, rebuttals that we get back every time when we're trying to talk about climate change. Yes, the climate has always been changing. But we need what we need to talk about is how is it changing now? and. When we look at that history of climate change in the world, it is moving faster now. Everything is happening faster now. And I want to go over some basics. So for some of you, I'll just be preaching to the choir on some of these things. And, uh, and then this is also being recorded. So hopefully, maybe in the future, someone will see this and find some of the things useful. Um, so the biggest deal with uh, like I'd mentioned with climate change is the rapid rate and the magnitude of the things that are happening now. And I feel that indigenous people of Alaska have been saying for a very long time, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. You know, uh, I've, I've gotten the luxury of living in and out of Sitka since uh, 1994 and watching the elders go to fish and game year after year after year saying, please stop taking so much herring. Please stop taking so much herring. And then we watched uh, last season uh, them being allotted so much percentage of a poundage of herring and then not enough show up to even be able to reach that harvest. And then this year, the herring told them no. And they didn't even get to do a commercial harvest of herring. You know, and, and last year is the first year in the history of fishing game in which they shut down uh, commercial fishing for king salmon in a 500 mile stretch. This is, uh, this summer was the first year in the history of recorded history in which the entire uh, Alaska sea ice melted across the shoreline. You couldn't find it within 150 miles. Uh, for those of you that were here uh, earlier in the presentation before, you got to experience Sarah Betcher's um, documentary that she did in Kotzebue with Ross Schaefer and, and Bob Schaefer, and then talking about how the sea ice has been changing and, and what it means to them as in Yupiak people harvesting seal and, and beluga and uh, all the birds. And oh, my, my heart broke a little bit this summer, you know, watching thousands upon thousands upon thousands of salmon dying in the rivers that were too hot for them to get up and them having heart attacks, them all uh, going up and not being able to spawn, dying before they spawn, and, and still people crying fake news. And you know, and that was so many rivers. You've got the Koyukuk, the, the Yukon, the Kuskokwim. You've got them dying all the way as far north as Kotzebue. And then not just the salmon, just, uh, just a couple of uh, days ago, my, my friend Jennifer Andruli posted a picture in Kasilov in which the entire beach is covered with dead jellyfish. I mean, there, there isn't even a space between them. The whole beach is just dead jellyfish. And then you have also this year hundreds upon hundreds of ring seal and harbor seal uh, dying. You have thousands and thousands of birds showing up in people's villages. Uh, my, my partner's father, Ross, you know, every, when he walks along uh, the beach in Kotzebue, it's every 10 feet there's a dead puffin or, you know, and these are ocean birds that don't normally come to shore, you know? And we, the whole world needs indigenous voices right now. They need it a long time ago, <laughs> so there is that. But the indigenous voice is so needed for the entire world. And when we look at that idea, the climate has always been changing, and how fast it's been changing. It's really important to, I mean, we have to look at ourselves on a micro and macro level, right? We have to look at who we are here and who we are in this web of life on the planet. And, you know, for, actually, I'm doing this for memory and this is actually my PowerPoint somewhere I should be talking about these things. Uh, 
So when, when we're looking at climate change and what we're experiencing here in Alaska, we get all the symptoms of climate change here in Alaska. Um, we have the glacial temperature rise, we have warming ocean, we have shrinking ice sheets, we have glacial retreats, we have decreased snow cover happening, we have rising sea levels, we have declining Arctic sea ice, we have some extreme uh, weather events happening, and ocean acidification. Every single last thing for climate changing is happening here. And in the last 50 years, the entire global uh, temperature has risen by two degrees, and in Alaska, twice as much. Climate change is happening twice as fast in Alaska versus the rest of the planet. That's really, really, really important to take a look at. And uh, like Sarah and Akicek had, had mentioned before in, in their presentation, uh, we're having a harder time adapting to that. And not only us, of course, the animals. You're finding that birds are having a harder time. Uh, you know, they're trying to lay their eggs earlier. Uh, you have, but now you have thousands and thousands and thousands of birds dying off. And in the last 50 years, uh, North America has lost almost 30% of its population of birds on a grand scale, you know, and now it's happening even more. And when we look at human beings, uh, oftentimes it feels to indigenous people that the Western world is trying to remove human beings from this equation. And from the indigenous perspective, we are just simply a part of this web, a part of this equation. And we have to look at who we are as a human population being a species, right? So for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, the planet hung out around 5 million people give or take. I don't know who was doing the census back then, but uh, you know, that's, that's the general consensus is that there was about five million people and it took us uh, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years as a species to get to a billion. We reached that number in 1804. So if we take that number and think what was happening here, like I said, Sitka, so we were battling the Russians who had just showed up, you know, on this turf. and. So there's a billion people, and it took 127, so it took thousands of years to get a billion, and then it took 127 years to get to two billion. And then it took a 33 years to get to three billion. My grandpa was born uh, during the time in which we had two billion people. I guess this isn't even on, is it? Is it? Oh, okay, all right. And What's the next number? So in 1960, we reached 3 billion. And then here we have 17 years later, and I included 1977 because that's the year I was born. You know, and so that's, where are we at? 4.21 billion people. And now we're at 7.53 billion people. So I'm born around 4 billion. My grandpa born around 2 billion. When I'm my grandfather's age, there's going to be about 10 billion people on the planet. And now we have to talk about sustainable harvesting of salmon, you know, uh, trees. You know, there's a lot of conversations that we have to be having uh, about all of our resource extraction that we are doing here. And of course, not just for Tlinga people, not just for Alaska Native people, not just for Alaskans, for the entire planet we have to be having this conversation. And let's see, what was my next rambling? So when we're looking, you, you can't discount human population growth and say that we are not affecting the planet. And the amount of, so your, your basic understanding of climate change is that it does correlate with the Industrial Revolution. And uh, the use of fossil fuels and people, colonization, it's colonization. Uh, you can't, you should not be talking about climate change without be talking about colonization. And uh, I mean, nobody would have been 
it's all about resource extraction. Colonization is about resource extraction. And then, of course, that always happens at the detriment of the indigenous people in that area. And you find that the story of colonization has actually got the same themes and the same equations across the entire planet, whether you're talking about the Ainu people in Japan or the Maori people uh, in New Zealand or Tlingit people here and Yumpeak people in the north. And so what I also like to find is commonalities of themes of solutions is also nice uh, to take some time to look at. And I'll talk about some of those more towards uh, the end. But it is an absolute fact that, see, uh, that carbon is happening, <laughs> that we are having uh, greenhouse uh, gases emitted. We have to uh, respond to that. And there's some, some facts that I was reading a little bit about. I don't know if it's on actually this uh, uh, slide. Oh, look at that. Already getting into that. I think it's actually the, the one after that. But, uh, you know, I, I've worked in tourism a long time, and I give out a lot of my information to tourists in a two hour time period. But uh, I walk through, um, through our forest, and I am always telling them that not only do my people need this forest, the entire planet needs this forest. Trees are the lungs of the planet. They are what saves us. It's interesting that there's so many, and I've thought this forever, for so many years, it's interesting that there's so many scientists working on machines to remove CO2, uh, and why isn't everybody going out and planting like 20, 30 trees each, you know, uh, and at least helping uh, in that respect, and protecting what we have, and restoring the things that we have, and we can't help but uh, look at ourselves as clinket people and critique ourselves. And in this uh, meeting with uh, Western culture, we, you know, eventually acquired the Anxa corporations. And I don't necessarily want to badmouth see Alaska or things, but all of us know that they clear cut for us. And then all of us know that our cousins and uncles worked these jobs. You know, sometimes they were the only jobs people had access to in some of these places. But now, uh, as time has gone on, we now know we should not be clear cutting our forests. You know, and and that being said, I'm not against uh, industry or uh, smart economic industry. I guess things like that. Um, but who are we? We have to ask ourselves these questions all the time. Who are we as native people? When we say we're stewards of the land, what do you steward? What are you giving back and not just taking? You know, there's all these cultural protocols that we had about giving back and about reciprocity. And some of those things are broken. Our culture is fragmented in a lot of ways. So what does it mean when we take? I remember hearing one time uh, at a, a language immersion that I was at, and the elder talked about how when the very first roads were built here in Southeast Alaska, the villagers came out and cried. And they sang mourning songs. Because in the Klinka culture, our trees are also our grandmothers. This is where we come from. And I would like to have those connections no longer just be metaphors. I want them to be reality. I want every single last Klinkit person to care about ravens and their health. And I want every single last Klinkit person, and Haida, and Simshan, and, and of course, all the people who've moved in here. I want everybody to love Alaska just as much as we do. And then what does that mean? How are we taking care of these things? You know, it was, was it 22 gray whales that died this summer? in Alaska, let alone, you know? So we have to ask our whaling communities, what are we going to do? What are we going to make choices as indigenous people for the foods that we eat? Um, you know, for me personally, I'm not gonna go out and get herring eggs. That being said, if they show up on my doorstep and you bring me some, I'm going to eat them. Um, I'm not gonna put that anything go to waste, but I am going to choose not to go out and get them. And I know that other people are going to make that choice to go out and get them. But that's the choice I'm going to make for myself. And I'm going to try to inspire other people to make that choice too. Because even though I love them and even though I feel this cultural right to them, the king salmon have a right to them, the whales have a right to them, all the seals and sea lions have a right to them. I'm not the only thing with a right to them. So 
uh, it's just very important to put ourselves into the conversations that we're having about climate change as indigenous people, I think, differently, and with the reality of what does it mean to be the steward of this land? Because I want people to be able to harvest here for 10,000 more years, <coughs> which I don't know what that's gonna be like when there's 10 million people on the planet. When I am my grandfather's age, will I be telling people stories of salmon that no longer are. Because there are villages in Alaska that have been telling people about the salmon that no longer is. There are many villages that no longer get salmon that used to get salmon, or they're getting different fish now. So, uh, and I, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who have been talking about climate change for a long time. We have a lot, of course, lots of indigenous people. Uh, David Suzuki's daughter was very famous decades ago for her speech to the United Nations, you know, and now we have this young woman, uh, am I gonna mispronounce her name, Greta? Greta? Thunberg. Thunberg. Um, you know, that, that Swedish girl, wow. I think we're friends, she doesn't know it yet, but I should meet her. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I don't know how many people have seen this, but her words are important, and it's only a few minutes, and I love the simplicity behind it. And um, anyway, what should I say? She should say it. This is not a drill. My name is Greta Thunberg. We are living in the beginning of a mass extinction. Our climate is breaking down. Children like me are giving up their education to protest. But we can still fix this. You can still fix this. To survive, we need to stop burning fossil fuels. But this alone will not be enough. Lots of solutions are talked about. But what about a solution that is right in front of us? I'll let my friend George explain. There is a magic machine that sucks carbon out of the air, costs very little, and builds itself. It's called a tree. A tree is an example of a natural climate solution. Mangroves, peat bogs, jungles, marshes, seabeds, kelp forests, swamps, coral reefs, they take carbon out of the air and lock it away. Nature is a tool we can use to repair our broken climate. These natural climate solutions could make a massive difference. Pretty cool, right? But only if we also leave fossil fuels in the ground. Here's the crazy part. Right now, we are ignoring them. We spend 1,000 times more on global fossil fuel subsidies than on natural-based solutions. Natural climate solutions get just 2% of all the money used on tackling climate breakdown. This is your money. It is your taxes and your savings. Even more crazy, right now when we need nature the most, we're destroying it faster than ever. Up to 200 species are going extinct every single day. Much of the Arctic ice is gone. Most of our wild animals have gone. Much of our soil has gone. So what should we do? What should you do? It's simple. We need to protect, restore, and fund. Protect. Tropical forests are being cut down at the rate of 30 football pitches a minute. Where nature is doing something vital, we must protect it. Restore. Much of our planet has been damaged. But nature can regenerate, and we can help ecosystems bounce back. Fund. We need to stop funding things that destroy nature and pay for things that help it. It is that simple. Protect, restore, fund. This can happen everywhere. Many people have already begun using natural climate solutions. We need to do it on a massive scale. You can be part of this. Vote for people who defend nature. Share this video. Talk about this. All around the world, there are amazing movements fighting for nature. Join them. Everything counts.
What you do counts. What a smart little girl. <laughs> and uh, powerful. She believed in her words so much, she sailed across the ocean, she didn't fly. Uh, that's someone who's willing to walk her walk. And when I hear her and all of the people who've come before her saying these things, I can't help but self-analyze and go, well, what do we do? What do we do here? This is the world's largest temperate rainforest. <laughs> what are we going to do? Uh, apologize for the poor image. This is just the one that I could find. It's probably off a little bit. But if you're going to take a look at the forests of the world, <coughs> so here we are. Alaska's on fire. The Amazon's on fire. Africa's on fire. And Russia's on fire now. Right now, it hasn't stopped yet since, you know, it was a, about a month ago. It's all going across our Facebook pages and things. And now I'm not seeing it as much, but uh, everything's still on fire. It hasn't stopped. It's been burning this entire time. So you're left with these other smaller forests. We have to protect the Tongass National Rainforest. <laughs> yeah. We have to protect this forest. And we have to protect it not only for ourselves, but the entire planet. This is the lungs of the world. I wouldn't be setting some seeds and see Alaska's year about planting some more trees. <laughs> I'm currently looking up uh, all the different ways to start growing some trees myself, and guess what people are going to get from Christmas presents for me for a really long time. For the next couple of decades, everyone's getting trees from me, I think. And, uh, but that's scary. That is really, 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 really scary. The world needs us. The world needs indigenous people. people. The world needs our connection to place and our stories and how we do that and how we've adapted over time and what that means. And for us, we're actually going to have to learn completely new skills for adaptation because even in all of our, I mean, we're some of the oldest people on the entire planet to stay in one spot, to reside sustainably thousands and thousands of years. But our ancestors never experienced anything quite like this. They didn't experience the, the changing climate the way it is now. Oh, there it is. Yes, that was what I was just saying. We need to protect. We need to restore. We need to fund these things. Where are we at? OK. so. Of course, here in Alaska, there's people been doing these things for decades. There's some amazing scientists here. I think it's interesting when we put in Western science and indigenous science, you know, things like uh, biotech. Biotech is a science uh, that was started in the 70s, and they're considered a valid science. And when you look at science, they're all about observation, 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 as one of these scientists has recommended uh, for us to do. And for indigenous science, we've been observing for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And uh, some of the recommendations, I think I'm just going to, eh, I don't like that. So uh, I didn't bring my glasses. I did, actually. They're in that bag. Uh, so when we're looking here at Alaska, you go to the Alaska Climate uh, Adaptation Science Center, you're going to see, uh, so for weather stations that we have in Alaska trying to actually um, have that data, there are as many uh, weather stations in Michigan as there is in Alaska, except for Alaska is seven times the size. 
and huge amount of climate differences and things. And we have to have data in order to have a voice to the Western world. If we don't have it, they're not going to listen to us. So an example of that is a few years ago, uh, maybe it was only two winters ago, sorry, my time might be off, but we got hit with a lot of storms up here. And it was almost a dozen villages that were hit in a way that they were having to relocate things. And they applied for emergency funding to the federal government. They did all the things right, but guess what? There wasn't any uh, foundation data, so they denied them all. Not a single last one got the funding. Uh, so we have to have that kind of data. We have to have it in order to have a, a weighted voice in the Western world. They're not going to listen to us. Um, let me see. So what was one of the recommendations that they said? So uh, given the huge gradient and variety of topography, precipitation, temperature, characteristics in the state, more local climate data is critical to improving projections of future snowpack and climate conditions. Observation, 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 said National Weather Service hydrologist Aaron Jacobs when asked how we can improve the understanding of what our climate future looks like. What I also like, uh, something that they said this next, in addition to funding state and federal weather stations and monitoring sites, increase community observations through citizen science initiatives such as the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network, the Community Snow Observations, and the uh, National Drought uh, Impact Report. Those are three different websites that you can go to as a citizen scientist. You can report what's going on in your area. You can become that person. So uh, I'm not actually going to go uh, click on these links, um, but if you take a quick picture uh, of this, it'll take you. You'll be able to um, participate in the entire world's data acquisition of where we are at with climate. And, uh, and then, of course, drought. Drought is. Uh, it's a thing. So uh, of course, there's a little bit of a difference between weather and climate. So climate is you know, that long-term thing, and then the weather is the, the short-term weather that we're experiencing. But uh, here, and drought is something that's relative, right? So uh, 100 inches of rain in uh, somewhere in Southern California is a lot of rain. But somewhere like Ketchikan, that measures it by the foot that's a drought. So those things are important to think about um, when we are looking at climate and its relativity. It's not like the entire world is going to be a tropical place in, in the next 10, 20 years. And uh, one of my favorite ones uh, that I would like to inspire people to go to is to become a con community snow observation citizen scientist for NASA. Uh, I, I highly recommend uh, looking up that one and then participating uh, in that because Alaska, we're famous for snow. And we are no longer getting the snow the way that we used to. My brother and I used to play with each other by throwing each other off the porch into the snow and then digging each other out. And I don't think that kids have done that in a while, you know. Um, and so when we're looking at solutions, I'm going to go back on this just in case I'd said something I'm not supposed to. I didn't edit that. I, anyway, um, so when we're looking at solutions, becoming an active citizen scientist. You can do that through those websites. If anybody wants me to go back to those websites so that you can uh, take a snapshot of those, I can do that. Um, and then, of course, contact me. Uh, there's quite a few things that I am participating in now because I believe in the things that I'm saying. And we need everybody at the table. We need everybody at the table. And so um, uh, we, I do a handful of things. Uh, we're currently, I'm a part of a working group with the University of Alaska Southeast we have, uh, and the University of Washington. Uh, there's uh, Mike Navarro and I and Hune, uh, and we are partnering together to create uh, 
a course to hopefully inspire some young environmental scientists here in Southeast. And we're going to be reaching out to all of the tribes in Southeast and the way we're approaching this is not coming to the communities to tell people what to do. Instead, we are going to ask people what do you want? What is going on with your community? Because the issues that are happening in Ketchikan may not be the same issues that are important to the people of Angoon, which may not be the same issues for the people of Wrangell. And you look at uh, Klukwan now, where they're having to deal uh, with possibly fighting a mine that's there. But if they don't have a foundation of data, when that mine happens, they're not gonna have something to speak back to about the changes. So uh, we are slowly growing that and hopefully We'll have an introduction to that project happening by this summer, and then it will continue to grow based on the feedback that we get from the tribes uh, from around Southeast. And uh, it's a very different approach to science because oftentimes scientists come into your community to tell you exactly what they're studying. And we're gonna leave it open to that community if they are studying specifically just climate change or the impacts of mining in that area on their seal or uh, logging or tourism, uh, especially now when we have the funding cut for the Ocean Ranger you know, program or that battle happening. Um, so, what we hope to do is embed that within the University of Alaska system to then give our uh, young people a chance. Oh, actually, we're all young still, so, you know. Uh, if you want to come to college at 52, please come <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and participate in this. Uh, because the more we have more data and we have more of our voice in there, the better it is going to be, not just for us, but for the entire planet. And uh, I think that sometimes when we talk about things like climate change, there is a lot of doomsday uh, conversation happening and it gets overwhelming. You know, what can I do as an individual? You know, because there is all those small things that you can do, like changing your light bulbs and making, you know, being conscious of the plastic that you're using, using less. We know that oil isn't dis disappearing anytime soon, but what can we do? What, what can we use less of? What can we use more of? What can we do instead? And then, for me as a harvester, and thinking about climate change, it's really all about communicating, because all you have to do is put plant people in a room together, and we're like, ooh, well, my grandma said this, and then I have this recipe, and, then, you know, and so all of these stories come out. So one of the other things that we're going to be organizing here in Southeast that I've been a part of as a health educator uh, working for SEARCH was creating the Alaska Plants as Food and Medicine Symposium. And we used to do that for health professionals, and then of course, like many cool programs, the grant runs out. And so uh, what we've been actually doing is helping that to keep going by inspiring it in uh, more local places. So I believe Nome had one. And then uh, here in Southeast, the first one to happen was in Ketchikan. And uh, Hako, Hako. <laughs> and uh, my friend Naomi uh, Michelson is coming up here. We, we're winging this, so. Be patient with us. Uh, but uh, she just helped uh, organize the, the Ketchikan uh, Alaska Plants uh, Food and Medicine. And what our goal is, is to hopefully have one in every community. I got grandiose goals, so we'll just start with one and then we'll see how far we get. Um, but for a lot of people who participate in the Alaska Plants as Food and Medicine Symposium, uh, oftentimes have some fairly uh, life changing. Uh, and worldview uh, changing experiences, but would you like to tell us a little bit about your Ketchikan Symposium? Of course. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, uh, first of all, it was uh, an experiment, um, <laughs> and uh, it was normally the uh, plant and food symposiums that I was able to attend have been in Anchorage, uh, the Anchorage area. And um, I've been able to go maybe three or four times, and I'm always so inspired. And um, it was just uh, wonderful to get to, for me to learn about, and um, to just get connected to plants in general and people and um, the land. 
And so over uh, the last four or five years, just, um, you know, attending, I, I didn't even notice hardly anybody from Southeast attending. And um, recently, in the last three or four years, I saw our um, Clinkett brothers and sisters from Cake. And then we had, um, well, you were at the, for, you've been at all of them. Um, I, ha- I was the only one from Ketchikan um, that was attending. And so it just kind of felt like, oh, I wish I could um, tell everybody about this at home. Or I, I, w- I really was longing to share um, that experience. And just, um, but I can't tell you how much I loved it. And um, so I went to the tribe in Ketchikan, the Ketchikan Indian community, and um, basically asked if they would be interested in um, putting one on and uh, let them know that there was a little bit of funding in a certain area. And um, anyway, it happened really qu- quickly. And normally um, you'd want a lot of time to plan, um, but uh, we had a couple months and we decided to just get it done. And so um, we started planning in June, and then we, we had our symposium in September. And it was um, a day and a half, and we learned many lessons. And, um, but the takeaway messages were um, that uh, we want more of them. We wanted them longer. We wanted more time. We wanted them more often. Um, women that were um, elders or um, older stood up and said um this was the best day of my life um comments like um thank you for bringing this back to us we've been waiting um my heart is full uh it was just really overwhelming and um so it wasn't just that we were learning about the plants but we were learning about um how to harvest the plants um the ethical considerations um uh, definitely climate change, the, the effects of, uh, you know, um, don't, you know, being thankful and taking only what we need and uh, many lessons and uh, just was uh, wonderful to see people that were so, uh, I, I just believe that once we um, start using our foods and plants and remembering uh, about some of them that we'll naturally want to take better care of them. And uh, it's just like the herring eggs that we, it, once we, you know, if we grew up eating them, we, we want to protect them and we want to keep them t- uh, around and we want to, you know, our grandchildren to, to be eating them. And um, so anyway, I just, I had some comments and I think I said most of them about uh, the symposium that we had in Ketchikan. Um, it was overwhelming uh, because, um, probably a little bit because um, I was trying to pack it pack it with for in a day and a half and so I'd recommend taking time and um, if you have one in your community uh, taking space to really talk about um, you know each session and what it meant to each person and just taking more time to be and just to be together and um, but it was really beautiful and I'll just share a couple more and then um, if anybody wants, I'll be here this week if anybody has any questions, but um, I'm very excited about it, and it was, uh, um, it was just wonderful. Uh, I was inspired by the devotion and enthusiasm by people and their presentations. I really enjoyed it. That was one of the elders. Um, I should be thanking you for lifting my spirit, and it was a presenter that we asked to come in, but felt like they were the ones that received the gifts. Um, it was so full of love and great information. Uh, what a wonderful experience, and I am so grateful to have been a part of it. Uh, my heart is full, overwhelmed with heart and insight, full of gratitude. Uh, it was wonderful. It made me feel proud. Uh, thank you for bringing this back to us. Uh, it was an honor to participate. And this gathering was a time to re- re- relearn some of the knowledge that has been silent in us. So anyway, goodness, sheesh, I, I just think it was wonderful. And uh, yes. What were some of the topics? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, uh, some of the topics were, um, well, we had a lot of hands-on. Everything was um, hands-on. And I'm a foodie. I call it uh, indigenous foodie, but um, so we uh, had a lot of learning about how to harvest certain plants. Um, for example, beech greens, our beech asparagus, and and so we had um, people learning how to not just uh, 
learn about the plant, um, but also we um, cooked it together and then we ate it. And we had some shared different recipes. Um, we were making different salves or lotions. Um, and uh, we had um, invasive plant uh, uh, information. We had information about our musk eggs and seaweed 101. I mean, we think about all the seaweeds that we have in our communities and they're really, uh, most of them are all edible. And, you know, we had things on nutrition, how, um, packed of, uh, with vitamins and minerals. Our foods are really superfoods, and uh, just the different, uh, uh, yeah, we, it was a lot. <laughs> for, and we also had time and space for um, uh, some of the grandmothers to share. And um, then we also had our environmental um, specialist from the tribe talk about um, uh, te water testing and the environment and um, you know, PSP testing and um, a lot of wonderful things. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So there's a lot of things to do. <laughs> and uh, I'm one of those firm believers uh, that there is actually no solution to anything. <laughs> uh, I'm a big believer in we are always in this working group together. And we are always trying to make things hopefully better with the cards that we have at the time that we have them and we try our best to hand better cards to the next generation. And uh, Greta and, uh, and that age group, that's, that's that next generation. And I want to be led by people with that much passion, uh, that they are willing to uh, go across the ocean for what they believe in and uh, walk their walk. And, uh, and I love the fact that even though there is all of the hardships and all of the changes and all of the things, it's, it's not, it doesn't have to be as doomsday. Uh, it does not have to be that way if we make choices now and we make choices now that help to ripple out for generations to become. One scary fact that I did read the other day was uh, that uh, we've actually put so much uh, uh, greenhouse gases in that we've actually changed things for the next 12,000 generations. And that's very heavy, so I want to plant the trees now. I want to talk about our salmon now. I want to talk about our glaciers now. I want to talk about our oceans now. I want to, uh, I want to be able to communicate all the small changes, uh, the differences from Ketchikan, the differences from Sitka, the differences from Yakutat, the differences from Kotzebue. And then I also want to talk about all the similarities that are happening as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you say, you mentioned that there's really not enough data, and I'm a data person too, but who are our best resources to go to if we want to find out what is our current status of our forest right now? Mm -hmm. Because I take the ferry from here to Sitka, and I can't help but notice the dead trees, mm -hmm. and they keep getting worse and worse yeah. each time I take a trip to Sitka. So that... Yeah. Concerns me. Yeah, the the beetles are the and both the the uh, I, I can't remember what they're called he, hayfly some the ones that are getting the hemlock, and then um, sawfly, sawfly, mm -hmm. and then uh, and then the spruce beetles uh, attacking those. Yeah, uh, that makes me want to plant even more trees. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know that's that's a really hard one to fight because you know part of that happens because when you have these um, limited winter times that aren't very cold it doesn't kill them you know and and so the, it's becoming this perfect incubation center for them to be able to grow and there are people who are working on those issues within the forest service the southeast alaska conservation council I and mean, there's some people who've been there for decades uh fighting um uh, you know oftentimes when there's various things going on i like to call guy archibald i don't know how many of you know guy uh, i like to pick up the phone and call him man that guy's been in the trenches for decades uh and and helping and 
Uh, I think currently he's working on the mining um, thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so uh, he he's definitely a, a wealth of knowledge and, and resource, and uh, we have to have more uh, access to moments like this where we get to come together and find the resources within our communities and network and then speak back to any organizations that are standing in our way uh, for the most part and saying, no, this is what we want, this is what we need. And uh, but uh, and you know and it is hard because as Native people we've had the double-edged sword of things like SEAC or other um, uh, environmental groups, uh, but there's common ground. There's common ground to to stand on to help each other. Just recently, when we saw all those all those forest fires going on in Oregon, up to Washington, up into Canada, if our trees are dying and becoming so dry, that's not to say that we're not going to experience those same kinds of things here. Yeah. And, and to me, again, that's very scary. Yeah. yeah I mean, we're surrounded by these trees. Uh, if we had a big fire, we're going to be in big trouble. Yeah. They are our grandmothers, and they are dying. And we are also cutting them now. So we have to change the way we're looking at things. We have to change the way we're interacting with the world. And it is hard because we have to survive in the Western world. And a huge amount of what has been brought to us here in Alaska is resource extraction. You know, they wouldn't have come if they couldn't have made the money. And they wouldn't have stayed, you know. We were sewers folly for a long time, you know. Um, and so I would rather make other things more economically viable. Uh, you know, and tourism is one of those things that's kind of a double-edged sword, you know, also and especially with the cruise ships and things coming in, but, uh, and then if those tourism groups are resource extraction or not, whether they're going, coming here for salmon and halibut or they're just coming for the picture of the whale in the distance, you know. Um, but uh, my preference is to figure out how to employ our people differently that allows them to stay in this area. And my preference would be in ways that are stewards of the land. And there is always that reciprocity uh, that happens, the give and the take. Um, you know, because some people are going to counter the argument of uh, not cutting down trees, you know, with that idea of, well, if we don't cut these trees down, then there's just going to be a fire. Um, clear cutting is not good. It doesn't matter any which way you put it. It's cost effective, but it's not good. It's not good for anything that's around it. And unfortunately, some of the solutions for dealing with things like spruce beetles and sawflies is to burn it down and kill them uh, by a controlled fire. You know, that is one of the solutions, you know. And some of the other solutions then, of course, are um, uh, chemicals. And, and, and things like that. Uh, so sometimes I feel like it has to be a long-term solution. Um, in, I mean, there's the immediate s solutions that we need to deal with things, but how many people do we have in Southeast? 60,000 What if 60,000 people went out and planted a tree? What if, 60, what if we started making new traditions? Uh, I'd like to see a new tr clinket tradition. Every time a child's born, we go out and each family member plants a tree for that kid. You know, One tree gives enough oxygen for 18 people. Um, that's amazing. You know, trees really are our grandmothers. They really are. And I think we also need to have an awareness of what species of trees are going to be resilient in a changing climate. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and the landscape of Alaska has always been changing. The climate has always been changing. You know, but we are the species on the planet that gets to sit down and talk about it. <laughs> you know, uh, all the other species don't get that uh, opportunity. Um, and I would really like to encourage people to uh, seek out ways to be citizen scientists, to make sure that you have a voice. And then um, for my partner and I, we've opened Planet Alaska downtown. 
uh, our gallery is right down there on Ferry Way. And come down and see us, come down and talk to us, come down and sign up for the things that we're doing and the things that we're going to hopefully be networking on throughout. You'll be able to come to us to get more information on when the next plants as food and medicine symposiums are, as the growth of, and you can also check out our Facebook page as well. We always post the updates of the things that we're doing uh, there as we continue to grow the course through the University of Alaska, hopefully inspiring uh, more local uh, and rural uh, people to become environmental scientists, uh, oceanographers. Uh, we need, we need uh, our people in all of those uh, sciences. And then, uh, and then also uh, the other program that we're starting this spring is called Hike, Harvest, and Heal. Because at the same time as we are dealing with um, these things, there's trauma that comes along with that, with losing access to your traditional foods, and uh, we, and then also all the other losses that we experience in the high amounts of various social ills that we're all struggling with uh, on daily basis. Um, hike, hiking and harvesting is is how Clinka people heal. You know, is we have the potlatch, you know, a year after someone passes away, and we spend that whole year with our friends and family harvesting the foods that we're then going to give. You know, and so. Uh, and hopefully that will get more plant people in the same room talking about all the different changes that we're all experiencing because that is exactly what happens when you put the plant people in the room. You know, you have people saying, oh, we normally harvest seaweed when the Indian celery is so tall and now we find out that they aren't harvested together in the same way, uh, in the same places. Or uh, we're having to harvest all the early buds sooner or the new greens sooner. Um, you know, it was two years ago I stood on the salmon bridge over Indian River uh, in Sitka, it was February and it was 62 degrees and I stood there in my shorts and t-shirt. That's, you know, that's a pretty big deal. So uh, actually it's a perfect segue into the next speaker. Uh, Mita has actually just come in and uh, if uh, we, if I get it right, uh, it is on that topic of uh, harvesting and climate change and how that affects uh, our mental health. And uh, so, yay. Is there any more questions? No? I'm going to sheesh. Good evening.